Hey everybody, welcome to Jimmy's Records and Tapes. I'm Jimmy Pardo. This week we're talking about 1976. Bicentennial. We've got it on vinyl, CD and cassette. We've got pop rock, heavy metal, punk, funk, rap, and new wave. All sales are final, but you'll never regret all the music you get at Jimmy's Records and Tapes. I'm loving music again. Hey everybody, indeed. Welcome to Jimmy's Records and Tapes. Uh, as a reminder, this is the show where I take you down memory lane, courtesy of my record collection. This week, talk about 1976, Bicentennial, Red, White, and Blue, salute it! This shirt's a little too tight. Here's the thing. Uh, everything was red, white, and blue in 1976. My neighborhood painted the fire hydrants red, white, and blue, the, uh, the mailboxes. Uh, it was a very exciting time um, for those colors. Um, what was happening in the country? Uh, Nadia Kamenich, or Nadia Kamenichi. It's still to this day, people pronounce it two different ways. Uh, I'd like to settle on one, and I couldn't. So whichever one you want to use at home, feel free. But young Nadia, she had her own theme. Um, she was 14 years old. She won three gold, five overall at the Montreal Olympics. Also, the first Concorde flight uh, was taken, which nobody really cared about until 1985 when Phil Collins flew from uh, Wembley to Philadelphia uh, for Live Aid. Also, Cher was on that flight, uh, and rumor has it she didn't know why Phil Collins was on there. Uh, she did not know about Live Aid, which I find to be insane, um, because as a young boy, a teenager, I knew about Live Aid, and um, you'd think that somebody in the business would have known about it. You'd think that somebody would have said, hey, Cher, did you hear about Live Aid at some point? But no, that never came up. Why? Why did we keep Cher in the dark about Live Aid? Why were we hiding Live Aid from Cher? Anyway, the Concord flew in 1976. Apple was formed in 1976, and I use an Apple computer to this day. Granted, I bought my first one about three years ago, but I love it, right? An Apple a day keeps the doctor away, but that's what they say. Uh, so why wouldn't an Apple computer keep a virus away? Is anybody happy with that joke? Nope, I am not. What could you get for your dollar in 1976? Well, let me tell you, my friends, for 59 cents, you can get yourself a gallon of gasoline. Uh, my mom used to always say, fill her up, and it would cost about $3. Uh, a house would cost about $43,000. And if you wanted a state-of-the-art television, let's say a 25-inch TV, which I can't imagine how that had to seem like, we've got a movie screen in our house. 25-inch TV would cost you about $600. The song of the year, the best-selling song was Wings, Silly Love Songs, which a lot of people hate. I like it. Uh, the album of the year was the live album by Peter Frampton, Frampton Comes Alive, which everybody listened to uh, in my neighborhood uh, nonstop. And Rolling Stone Magazine's album of the year was Boz Skaggs, Silk Degrees, which I'm 100% sure that if they went back, they would change that. Because there's no way Rolling Stone and their hipster ways would ever now go, hey, you know who's great? Boz Skaggs. But the album we're going to be talking about here today uh, from Jimmy's Records and Tapes uh, from my childhood, from my life, is Kisses Rock and Roll Over, released November 11th of 1976. It just squeezes in there at the tail end of the year. Um, it got all the way to Billboard's uh, number 11 on the chart, produced by Eddie Kramer. Now, this album, this aforementioned Kiss Rock and Roll Over, this was the one that got me. This was the one that got me hooked on Kiss. Um, I had seen them in the Paul Lynn special, um, where I was like, who are these monsters and why are they singing music? Um, I had post I had posters of Kiss before I heard one lick of music other than the Paul Lynn special. Um, my brother and I would go to uh, Woolworth, which had a great record uh, department, but they also had the an iron on department and they would wear that you know they would um you'd buy a t-shirt and then you'd pick out your iron on uh from the displays and then they would use that big huge steam press uh then they would leave that on your shirt uh and you know they had a bunch of you know maybe keep on trucking who wants to party and then four thousand kiss designs uh this one the cover of rock and roll over which i just to this day still gives me chills that's how much i love this cover um we were poor growing up so we couldn't really afford to get the iron-ons unless it was for a birthday or Christmas. And uh, so what my brother and I would do when we'd go to the mall is um, we would ask the guy for the wax, um, basically garbage. After it would be adhered to the shirt, it would still be an image of what the uh, of what the picture was on this piece of wax. 
And my brother and I would ask, we would hang out around there and we would ask them, hey, can we get that wax? And they would think, really? It's gonna, it's really just garbage. And we made this up and it turned out to be true. We said, yeah, but if you put it in a window, it's like stained glass. So it's like a poster on your window. And, the, and then in those days, everybody's like, hey, man, that's far out. That's a great idea. And then we immediately raced home to see, hey, can that really work? It did. This album also, I was over at a girl named Shannon's house. I'll leave out the last name for legal reasons uh, because her sister was doing cocaine. And I don't really remember, uh, at the time rather, I didn't really know what cocaine was. And I remember just going, hey, what are they doing? And uh, Shannon said, oh, that's some grown up stuff. Uh, I now know they were doing cocaine. I was there hoping we'd play Spin the Bottle and, and Smooch. Uh, her sister was doing cocaine. Uh, anyway, at Shannon's house, uh, I wanted so badly to hear the new Kiss song. So we called WLS uh, to request Calling Dr. Love by Kiss. And we would call it, uh, I would say, to the annoyance of the producer and or DJ who would answer uh, 4,000 times in that hour. Um, it may have been longer. I don't know. Everybody else in the place was doing cocaine. Um, so they're hopped up on coke. And we're calling LS nonstop saying, can you play Dr. Love? Can you play Dr. Love? Can you? And they're like, you got it. Coming up soon. You got it. Coming up soon. Now, I never heard the song. I just wanted to be cool in front of these cokeheads that I knew what Kiss was. And so I kept asking for them to play it. And finally, I called one time and I go, uh, hey, can you play Calling Dr. Love by Kiss? And the guy goes, it's on right now, genius. And I went, yep, you got it. It sure is. And uh, we then enjoyed uh, Calling Dr. Love, or at least the second half of Calling Dr. Love by Kiss. Um we enjoyed that song, uh, courtesy of uh, Shannon's family's uh, stereo uh, that, again, had nearby people doing cocaine. This was Kiss's fifth studio album. It's got Hard Luck Woman on it, which is a great song that Paul Stanley wrote that he wanted Rod Stewart to do. And if you listen to it, it sounds very much like a Rod Stewart song. Some would say, like, uh, kind of like he ripped off a Rod Stewart song. Um, it was uh, sung by Peter Chris. Uh, he ended up having a little bit of a Rod Stewart vibe to him, uh, to his voice. Uh, it went top 20. Uh, it's got my favorite song of the album uh, called Take Me. It's got Mr. Speed. Uh, those were both uh, written by uh, Paul Stanley and Sean Delaney. Quick side story. Sean spells his name S-E-A-N, which I thought was pronounced seen until I was way too late in life. Um, and then, of course, uh, Gene Simmons, the demon. Uh, he wrote uh, See You In My Dreams, which is a great song. And the aforementioned Dr. Love. Peter Chris had one song on this album called Baby Driver. And boy, does it suck. Anyhow, that is Kiss's Rock and Roll Over, um, probably my favorite Kiss album of all time. Hey, this week's quick hit is C.W. McCall's Convoy. Uh, it went to number one in January of 1976. The song was released in 75 when the world was crazy for CB radios. But it went to the top of the charts at the beginning of 1976, which is why I felt the need to include it here. Um... My dad had a CB radio. It was very important that my dad communicate with the truckers on his 15-minute drive to work. Um, but in fairness, everybody did. Everybody had a CB radio in their car with that big whip antenna. Um, and for Christmas that year, um, I had asked for a CB radio, and there was a little toy CB radio that got a total of one channel, channel 14. And if my dad would pull up way up the driveway, he and I could talk to each other. Otherwise, it was a lot of me going, uh, Breaker 1-4, Breaker 1-4, Breaker 1-4, and then dealing with the squelch, uh, because again, it had no range whatsoever. But if my dad would pull way up in the driveway, where I'm pretty sure all that separated us was one wall, uh, we could talk uh, via CB radio. And uh, that's probably the same bond that we have today, is um, talking through walls. Why can't we just lower those walls, Father? I don't call my dad father. That would be insane. A movie was made in 1978 uh, based on the song Convoy um, that starred Chris Christopherson, Ally McGraw, and was uh, directed by Sam Peckinpah. It is Peckinpah's most popular movie. His most successful movie is this junk called Convoy, and it made $45 million. Break it one down for a hit! Hey, everybody, that is this week's Jimmy's Records and Tapes. If you dug it, like us, subscribe to us. Want to follow me some more? I'm over at Twitter at, at Jimmy Pardo. And of course, I host the award winning podcast, Never Not Funny. So check that out uh, via Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, the record store is closed. We'll see you next week.